Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Tuesday Cerebellar Seminars. Um, today, we have Nadia Cervenera. She received her PhD in neurobiology uh, with John Rawson in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, uh, from Monash University, uh, where she performed experiments looking at the role of the climbing fibers and uh, how they regulated the simple spike activity of Purkinje cells. She discovered that when the climbing fiber input was um, uh, suppressed, the Purkinje cell simple spikes uh, just increased tremendously. And when the climbing fiber uh, input was brought back to baseline, so did the simple spike activity. And this was a really uh, a stunning example of how the Oliveri input regulated the simple spike activity of Purkinje cells. Then she went to University of Bristol, where she has remained um, and where she is now an assistant professor or lecturer. Um, she uh, did her postdoc with Richard Apps, and um, she has uh, contributed to many aspects of physiology, including co concepts associated with synchrony and um, uh, now uh, uh, ideas associated with behavior, prism adaptation, many aspects of uh, Parkinson's and cerebellar disease. Today, she's going to talk to us about the role of the cerebellum in um, uh, behaviors that require greater than millisecond precision, things that might take a second or so to develop and the role of the cerebellum in uh, uh, control of those behaviors. Nadia, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to present some of the recent experiments from the lab. And the work that I'm presenting today um, formed part of the PhD work from a very talented PhD student, um, Ellen Bovin, who was supervised by myself and Richard Apps. And she's recently moved to Rotterdam to work in Gal's lab at Erasmus. And as Reza said, I'm going to, to present some experiments where we looked at the role of the cerebellum in temporal processing, but in particular, how it contributes to our ability to process temporal information in the suprasecond range. So I just wanted to start off with sort of talking about why timing is important. So timing's important for a wide range of behaviors and this ranges from our ability to stretch our arms up and to catch a ball um, when we're standing on the footpath and we've got a busy road in front of us and we're making judgments on whether to uh, cross a road so to looking for a break in the traffic so that we can cross the road safely and even things like talking or listening to music and dancing, these all require our ability to um, encode time. And so the ability to encode temporal information across a wide range of um, scales is essential for adaptive behaviour. And we continually adapt our behaviour to cope with the different time scales. Um, in our environment. And these range from um, um, long time scales, sorry, I just put my laser point on, long time scales, um, slow changes in the world. So for example, circadian rhythms to fast trajectories in the sub-second and millisecond range. Um, and these are important for things like um, body movements. And so we've developed um, multiple systems to deal with these various um, time scales um, over um, time scales that vary over 10 orders of magnitude. Now, in terms of the cerebellum, um, it's long been thought to play a very important role in timing in the sub-second and millisecond range. And that isn't terribly surprising given its traditional role in sensory motor control that requires millisecond timing um, yeah, for the motor response and things like motor learning. And instead, behavior uh, related to supersecond range, so things like um, interval timing and decision making, has long been thought to be the preserve of the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia. However, more recent studies have shown that this division 
might not be as clear cut as it once was thought. So we have this new view of um, timing um, processing uh, within the cerebellum. So just focusing to start off with on the cerebellum and subsecond timing, some of the most um, compelling evidence for the role of the cerebellum in subsecond timing comes from lesion studies. So in the case of human work, and in particular from Richard Ivory's lab, um, participants were asked to synchronize finger taps um, with a short tone that was played at regular intervals. So for example, 500 milliseconds. And at some point the tones stopped and the participants were asked to continue tapping at that same rate. And what they found was that cerebellar patients were impaired with, when they were asked to perform this task. So they have, were impaired doing this, but also they showed a lot more variability uh, in terms of their tapping. But some of the um, best known examples of the cerebellum in subsecond timing comes from eye blink conditioning. And this is where a neutral stimulus, so um, a conditioned stimulus such as a tone or, or, or a light, is presented and after uh, some uh, couple of hundred milliseconds later an unconditioned stimulus such as an air puff to the eye um, is delivered and this overlaps with this um, conditioned stimulus. Now this unconditioned stimulus on its own causes an eye blink known as an unconditioned response. Now when you repeat the pairings of this conditioned with this unconditioned stimulus, the organism learns to associate this neutral stimulus with this impending aversive event. And so this leads to an eventual development of an, a, a conditioned response. So this is a preemptive eye blink to what was once this neutral stimulus. And this um, conditioned response is timed to occur just before the occurrence of this unconditioned stimulus. And numerous studies have consistently demonstrated that the timing of this conditioned response is impaired with cerebellar inactivation and lesions. So several studies, as I said, have shown that the neural activity in the cerebellum may be related to um, um, a subsecond timing, um, but what about suprasecond timing? So again, some of the best examples or um, evidence that we have for this is from human lesion studies. So in this study by uh, Gooch et al, um, they had uh, cerebellar patients and um, control participants, and they were asked to do two tasks. So one is the time production task, and the other one is the time estimation task. And in the time production task, the participants were cued with an instruction that ranged from two up to 12 seconds. And they were asked to press the space bar on a keyboard when they believed that this uh, required interval had elapsed. Whereas in the time estimation task, the participants fixated on a point on the computer screen and it remained there for a variable length of time. And again, this time ranged from two seconds up to 12 seconds. And then they were then asked to estimate how long they thought this stimulus had been present for. Now in both of these tasks, participants who had uh, lateral cerebellar damage, so this is indicated here by the green arrows, um, they were found to, in the time production task, um, were found to have increase in their time measurements. And in the time estimation task, they were found to have a decrease in their measurements over these two tasks. And this is in comparison to the control, which is shown in the um, black lines. And then the other participants were still cerebellar patients, but these were in areas outside of the lateral cerebellum, so other obviously medial parts and paravermal parts. So 
this was quite convincing evidence that cerebellar patients uh, have difficulty timing um, in terms of their time processing, in terms of not only time estimation, but also time production uh, at the uh, suprasecond range. So there's also evidence if you look at some of the neural recordings um, within the cerebellum that the neural activity may actually also be related to suprasecond timing. And so this first example comes from Tim Ebner's lab. And in this experiment, the primates performed a pseudo random tracking task. And when they recorded from Purkinje cells, they found that the simple spike activity um, could correlate with the kinematics and the performance errors, not only over short periods of time, but also longer time frames. And they suggested that this represents both the upcoming and preceding behavior. And they suggested that this activity can then be used to evaluate past performance and provide update of subsequent commands. And also more recently, we've also got um, uh, an example from Mark Wagner, where they imaged the granule cells, the calcium imaging in mice, where the mice had to pull on a lever to receive a reward. And what they found was that the granule cells exhibited this sustained ramping up activity um, after the lever was pulled up until the time when even um, beyond of when they received their reward. And so suggesting that this actually, this granule cell signaling may represent the time interval related to anticipated uh, reward delivery. And the, the final study I want to show you that to hope you convince you that cerebellum is involved in um, suprasecond timing is a study by Crystal Parker. And in this study, uh, rats had to estimate a 12 second interval uh, starting from the onset from a stimulus. And what they then had to do was then they then had to press a lever 12 seconds later to retrieve a reward. Any lever presses that occurred before this um, were ignored and not reinforced. Now, what they found was that when you infuse muscomol in the uh, lateral nucleus of the cerebellum, the rats are impaired in this interval timing task when you compare um, their performance to a saline infusion. And what they also did in this paper was they also recorded from um, the lateral nuclear cells and the medial prefrontal cortex, cortex. So as we all now know, the cerebellum has a role to play in cognition and it has these um, indirect connections with the medial prefrontal cortex. And they found that when they recorded from both of these structures, they found that uh, in response to the cue um, leading up to this 12 second interval, you get this ramping up activity at the same time or this co-activation um, during these suprasecond timing tasks, suggesting that perhaps it's the um, lateral cerebellar nuclear cells which provide the medial prefrontal cortex um, with um, temporal information. And so hopefully I've convinced you that collectively we have a number of studies that question the dogma that the cerebellum um, only has a role to play in sub-second timing and then it also may be involved in suprasecond timing behaviours. And so we wanted to explore this idea further in the lab by using a time interval task. So suprasecond timing behaviours um, uh, are mostly studied using behavioural paradigms um, of interval timing tasks. And these involve um, monitoring time in the second to minute range to drive a goal-directed behaviour or to, um, to be used in decision-making. And so in order to explore the um, cerebellar contributions to 
super second time processing, we decided to adopt this interval timing task in rats, which was first presented by Zuatel. And this required the rats to estimate the time instructed by a sound duration by terminating a nose po poke from a waiting port into a reward port. And the instruction was given by a sound duration and um, they were given test trials that were interleaved between instruction trials, tri instruction trials, sorry. And during these um, test trials, the animal had to, um, these were prolonged by uh, one second. And so the animal could no longer use the instructive sound to guide when they had to leave the port. Because just using the instructive sound to um, uh, express this behavior and during the reward window, they could use the offset of this sound. However, with this increase in the um, test signal by um, an additional one second, they could no longer use the end of this cue to instruct them when to move into the reward port. So they had to use some sort of internal timing interval um, to, to, to decide when to move to collect their reward. The other driver for using um, this particular task was because um, that what in, they also did in this paper was they cooled the medial prefrontal cortex and found that when they did this, the animals um, showed that they were much slower um, to exit the um, waiting port to retrieve, retrieve the reward, suggesting that it slows their ability to estimate time. And then when they did the same thing at the motor cortex, they showed no effect. So therefore showing that this behavior is very much uh, prefrontal cortex dependent. So therefore we wanted to use this paradigm um, or replicate this behavioral paradigm to in investigate the role of the cerebellum in this task. So instead of using a cooling strategy, we decided we'd um, use a chemogenetic strategy. And so we first um, transected neurons, um, or transfected rather, neurons in the lateral nucleus um, with an inhibitory dread uh, receptor. We also had obviously our control virus as well. And we targeted, we tried to target our um, virus in the ventral aspect of the lateral nucleus, as it's been shown um, in rodents that it's this part of the lateral nucleus which relays information to supersecond timing regions like um, the prefrontal cortex. Now, after the animals were um, infused with this, um, with the virus, um, we then um, trained the animals on what we're calling the predictable time cue task. And this is um, similar to the, um, the task that I just uh, presented in terms of the instructive trials. So I'll, I'll explain how exactly this um, paradigm works. So the animals self-initiate the trial by poking their nose into what we call the hold port. And then after a random delay, a cue is presented which consists of a white noise tone for two and a half seconds. And after this um, period of time, the rat can exit the hold port to retrieve its reward from the reward port. Now the rat had a window, a reward window of time from which it could retrieve its reward. And this was 250 second, 250 milliseconds before the end of the um, queue and finished one second after the end of this queue or end of this tone. Now the trial outcome 
depended on when the rat exited this hold port. So if the rat exited this hold port um, during this random delay, we call this uh, these trials as too early. If they ex exited the hold port after the stimulus um, is switched on, but before the reward window, this was classed as an incorrect trial. Obviously, animals, when they collected their reward within this reward window or exited within this reward window, this was deemed a correct trial. And any nose poke releases from this hold port that occurred beyond this reward window were called too late trials. And so we measured the exit times from the hold port um, to determine this. And also um, we also calculated the reward latency. So this was how long the rat took to move from the hold port to the reward port. And we also measured overall performance of this task. So once the animals were able to do this task, we then um, infused CNO or vehicle to see how this affected um, the, the measurements that we were taking. So percentage performance, so it's the number of correct trials during the reward window. Um, the exit time, so taken from the, when they were, uh, moved from the hold port um, to subtracting that from the onset of the tome and the reward latency, so how long they took to move from this hold port to the reward port. So once we'd done this, we then moved on to what we're calling the unpredictable time queue. So these are similar to when in the zoo paper where they interleaved instructive trials with test trials. So we still have our um, queued trial, but we also interleaved with this, what we're calling our uncued trial. So this is where the tone, it's the same tone, so it's still white noise, but it's delivered for one second later. So for a total duration of three and a half seconds. So these are called uncued trials because the exit from the hold port is, you, you can't use the end of the tone to um, know when to move out of the port. So this tests the ability of the animal to um, estimate the time interval rather than respond or anticipate to the end of a tone. And so similarly to what we did with the predictable time cues, we then um, gave um, CNO or vehicle and um, measured uh, percentage performance, the exit time and the reward latency. So I'm just gonna play a video um, of an example of a queued trial. Um, I realized when I put this rat together, uh, rat together, this, presentation together that I somehow lost the audio on these um, videos. So I had examples of all the different types of trials, but it seemed a bit pointless showing them if there was no audio. So I'll just show one example. Um, let's take this off. So I'll just play it. So you'll see that the rat will go into the left port, which is the hold port. It will hold there, the tone's being played, and then it goes into the uh, reward port to retrieve its sugar pellet. So what sort of data are we getting? So in terms of baseline behavior, let's just look at the predictable um, behavior baseline. So this shows the um, probability probability density function of, of the average of the animals um, as they exit the um, holding port. And you can see that um, that we get the, um, so the target is obviously two and a half seconds here. And you can see that um, we're getting a peak time here around uh, just after our um, 
target time. But the other interesting thing is we seem to see we have this sort of bimodal distribution, which you can see again here in the individual traces. Um, these are from individual animals. Um, and whether that's because some animals show use the end of the um, the tone to move out of the port, some are anticipating and they're moving earlier, or whether it's animals using both strategies. We're not we're not sure at this point in time. Sorry. When we moved to the unpredictable um, stage of the task. So this is where the animals still had the cued trials, but we also had interleaved uncued trials. You can see this is again in the average. You can see here that with our cued trials, again, this is coming after the target. So after the two and a half seconds, which suggests that they're using the end of the queue to time when to move the um, move out of the holding port, whereas um, when on the trials which had three and a half second tone, because they can't use the end of that tone to estimate when to move out of that holding port, they're having to use some sort of internal estimate. So you can see that it's it's peaks at the um, target time window. Here we've just um, split up in terms of the individual animals, um, again showing um, that for the two and a half seconds, the majority of them um, peak afterwards, whereas for the uncued trials, these uh, are occurring before our target window, suggesting there's some sort of um, time estimation going on. So we also tried to do some semi-quantitative mapping of the expression of the virus across the um, lateral nucleus. Um, and we um, the expression is indicated by this um, uh, heat map where expression at zero shows um, no expression and maximal expression is at um, six. Any points in grey on the on the maps here uh, is where we couldn't um, quantify the expression. And you can see that although the um, virus is uh, centered on the lateral nucleus, it wasn't restricted restricted to the to the lateral nucleus um, in terms of um, our inhibitory virus. So this becomes important more so for my my next slide because we wanted to obviously anything you do that manipulates the cerebellum, everyone always wants to know what's going on in terms of movement. And so we tested this on an open field exploration. So the animals were put into a circular arena and then um, monitored for 10 minutes on how much they explored the arena. So our yellow is our control viral animals and purple is our um, virus, our dread virus animals. So this is an example from, from um, um, two animals here. And you can see just using the raw um, exploratory data, you can see quite clearly that the um, dread animals are exploring the arena much less than the control viral animals. And you can see this here in the graph here, where we've um, plotted the distant travel, distance traveled over time. And you can see that um, the dread animals are exploring uh, much less than the control animals. But you can also see that the variability of exploration within these dread animals um, is quite high and presumably we think this is because the differences in the expression levels of the virus in relation to um, the um, CNO. Um, sorry, I should have said that this is um, the dread animals received the CNO. Um, so, uh, it's not just the having a, it's not the virus just having an effect. This is when they've received the CNO. Um, so 
we believe that this variability is because of the different levels of um, viral expression. Um, and this is quantified here in the terms of the total distance travel. So it's a, there's about a 50% reduction in the total distance traveled and um, they move much more slowly as well. About Again, it's about a 50%. But on the plus side, uh, I guess you could say that our CNO is having an effect. So we know for sure it's doing something, uh, which is good. Um, but obviously there is this confound that um, the animals do move differently once they're given the CNO. So in terms of the actual um, effects on the time interval task, um, so what's happening in terms of our um, measurements that we were taking in terms of um, performance, exit times and reward latency. So this is just looking at the predictable time queue. So this is where we think the animals are using the offset of the tone to make a decision on whether to move out of the port, the holding port to the reward port. And we used a generalized linear mixed model approach um, with um, animal trials and session date as random terms and the um, what we're measuring. So for example, reward latency as the dependent variable and um, group or manipulation. So whether which virus and the manipulation, so saline control or CNO as the independent variables. And what we found was that even though we showed with the open field, the animals obviously do move less and are much slower, their performance remains unchanged regardless of um, whether they receive what, what virus they receive and, and whether they receive the CNO or the control or the vehicle control. However, we did find a significant effect on the interaction between group and manipulation um, for the dread group when given CNO. And this was in terms of um, the uh, exit late, exit time. So this uh, was decreased by around um, 160 milliseconds. And in terms of the reward latency, um, this was, we found this had an increase of about 80 milliseconds. So this suggests that um, when we manipulate the cerebellum in this predictable time interval task, um, this affects the exit time and the reward latency time such that the um, dread group animals, when given the CNO, um, maintain their position in the hold port for longer, but are also slower when they move, move from the hold port to the reward port. And this is in the face of... Um, their effects on overall performance, which we um, show that there's no um, detectable effect on this. So what about um, when we introduced the um, condition where there's the um, unpredictable time queue? So again, we didn't see an effect on um, the overall performance of the animals, um, but there was an effect on exit times and reward latencies in the dread animals when they were given the CNO. So there was around a, um, a decrease actually um, from when they exited from the reward port. This was about of 100 milliseconds following the systemic injection of CNO. In terms of the reward latency, this was um, still slower and they, they increased their overall um, time in that of, of around um, 60 milliseconds. So this suggests in terms of the unpredictable time Q interval task that uh, cerebellar manipulation affects the exit time and the reward latency time differently um, compared to the predictable queue, such that the animals exit the um, 
holding port prematurely, um, but still move to the reward port um, slowly. So in conclusion, um, we found that the systemic manipulation of cerebellar output um, affects the integral timing task. Um, when the time cue was predictable, um, so in those situations, there was no time, no requirement for the animal to keep track of time. The animals could perform the task, um, but they um, exited the, um, uh, the holding port. Um, or the, the, their time to exit the holding port was uh, delayed. Um, whereas when the time queue in the um, unpredictable task, um, the animals exited the holding port uh, prematurely. Um, and in both conditions, um, or both time queues, the animals um, moved to the reward port um, more slowly. So although we, we saw a general motor deficit in terms of the open field, this deficit only seems to be related to the reward latency. And so this suggests that um, this interval timing task with unpredictable cues and predictable cues in particular, in terms of the unpredictable cues, this requires the animal to pay attention to the passage of time because they can't use the sound offset to indicate when they can retrieve their reward. And these, these findings are, are similar to what was seen in the cerebellar patients um, in terms of the time production and time estimation tasks. So where the patients um, increased their time measurements in terms of time production tasks, so the animals moved more slowly to the reward port, but in the cerebellar patients, they decreased their time measurements in the time estimation task, which is what we saw with our unpredictable cue where the animals were no longer, um, were, were moving out of their port much more quickly. So overall, our uh, findings seem to suggest that in addition to the sub-second um, timing, um, cerebellum could also have a role to play um, in timing in terms of supersecond timescales. And this may be through its interactions with other brain regions like the prefrontal cortex and may provide um, regions like the prefrontal cortex with predictions over longer time scales, which um, we would like to now take into the model that um, uh, Ellen um, worked on during her PhD. So just to acknowledge, um, obviously, Ellen, who, um, who, as I said, was a PhD student in the lab, obviously, um, Richard, who also co-supervised Ellen, and also we had some help from postdoc in the lab, Jasmine Pickford, and our wonderful technician, Rachel. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, Nadia, thank you so much for that didactic and thorough uh, presentation. If there are any questions, uh, please raise your hand, and uh, I'm sure Nadia would be happy to uh, answer them for you. Maybe I'll Maybe I'll start. Um, uh, the slowing of the movements. Now, did, did you see it from the perspective of when the animal left the um, the nose poke region and then when they entered the uh, reward region? Was that period um, slowed? Yes, it was, and that's why we ended up doing the open field as well because it was noticed. Um, we were. I think we we were expecting to not have motor deficits based on some of the work that had come out where people had used muscomol in the lateral nucleus and had all reported no motor deficits in publications. So we just assumed that, that would be the case. Now, whether it's related to the fact that we also got some expression um, in the interpositus, for example, um, or whether it's because of the different strategy we used, whether it's because of the chemogenetics, 
I don't know. One of the other things we'd like to do is to try to incorporate some of our semi-quantitative um, mapping of the viral expression into our GLM to see if the level of expression and therefore how effective the CNO is, um, whether that has any bearing on some of the results that we've found. Wonderful. Uh, Rich has raised his hand. Rich, please go ahead. Yes, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, actually, two questions, if I can. Uh, first is just, um, uh, I didn't, how many sessions do you do you do in this sort of experiment? I mean, does the deficit sort of persist or the behavior remain stable across successive uh, manipulations? Sure. So we we had more baseline because of the way we just did the experiment. So once they learned the task, so in terms of the predictable cue, um, they had a baseline session on a Monday, CNO or drug, uh, CNO or vehicle on the Tuesday, or washout period on the Wednesday, the opposite drug on the Thursday, and then another baseline. And then we repeated the following week or two using the unpredictable. So it was sort of um, we didn't we didn't repeat um, the the study um, multiple times. Um, now, whether we would have seen something different, um, I don't know, but they were um, highly trained animals. It, take, it took about six to eight weeks to train them. Um, so they were, I would say, expert animals in this. But whether um, the CNO would then have an effect again or whether we'd see the same deficits again, I, I, I don't know. I see. So just the one session where you do the mix. Yeah. Point. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, just I've seen, you know, rats seem to recover very quickly on a lot of lesion effects. So that's what I was curious about with this sort of lesion. But um, if you could flip back to the um, that slide from the 2010 or 12 study, basically showing what you're saying is sort of the parallel effect you're finding here. Because I, I wasn't sure of the... Um, what the dependent variable was in this, this one right here, right? Yep. So uh, is the, what is, uh, does the proportional error mean? Um, like how, I see if it was a two second thing and it's a 1.5, that means they're actually pressing about three seconds. This is, is that what proportional error means? They're 50% overestimating the time there? Yeah, I can't remember. There was an equation that they used, whereas, have to go back and look at the the paper um that's what you mean by they sort of overestimate yeah. on the production and they underestimate yes. on the uh, on the perception task here right and that's sort yes. of what you're saying is the parallel observation the way you're interpreting your predictable versus the uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes that's right yep and as i said they only seem to see this when it's a cerebellar patient with lateral cerebellum damage or dentate, whereas this sort of um, dotted line here, which is sort of hiding underneath the controls, um, they don't seem to see this effect. And you can see here as well. Um, so it seems to be particular for this time estimation and time production seems to be particular for lateral cerebellum, which one may argue you know, this is the region which sends inputs to the cerebral cortex to have this higher cognitive function. Um, right. And what's the sort of, um, you know, kind of working hypothesis about why you would get this reversal? I think uh, overestimation for production and underestimation, yeah, for, for the perception side. Is there some sort of... Passage yeah. of time or attention sort of account, or, or what's the idea? And the same sort of notion about in your own own study, like you know, what, what yeah, might... yeah. I mean, the original idea was to try and do some recordings, um, but uh, COVID sort of scuppered <laughs> plans on that. Um, because it's interesting because some other papers, or well, a more recent paper that's come out, which I didn't present here. Um, we're doing a longer time interval task where they, again, have infused muscomol and they don't see an effect. Um, 
with the musk mole. Um, but the difference between that task and ours is that the animals can um, continually move. And so I think what they, the reason why they're not seeing something is because the animals are doing something to try and help them do some sort of time estimation. So rats in particular um, will sort of do behaviours which help them sort of estimate time. So they'll do things like groom. They'll start from the top of their tail down to their tip and they'll do that to sort of help them estimate time, whereas our task they had to just hold in the port so there wasn't that opportunity to do that so I think there's some sort of um breaking up of the time that the cerebellum does which then feeds into these higher cognitive areas to sort of help with this but whether that's true or not I don't know that's just a, a working hypothesis but does it does that um can you apply that to talk about the sort of reversal between the production and the uh the perception task, because that seems to be the most intriguing, you know, notion, right? That that's sort of what you're saying, you're seeing in your study. Of course, there it's a little harder to think about production estimation, but this one clearly shows that sort of reversal. Yeah, I, d I don't know. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, whether it's, again, related to the fact that our virus spreads a bit more, and so it's not just targeted to the area of the dentate, which is meant to be cognitive, but then you've also got the other part of the lateral nucleus, which people say it's more motor, um, so the more dorsal part. And so whether, again, it's related to that, that one's responsible for the time production and one's for the time estimation, again, I don't know. So which is part of the sort of reason why we sort of thought about trying to include this in our GLM. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Nadia? I will go ahead and ask uh, another one from you. Um, uh, chemogenetics is still somewhat of a lesser used uh, tool, uh, certainly for the cerebellum, and you've now had an experience with it. Could you give us your your sense of it and, and um, any recommendations that you might have associated with its use? I mean, it's nice in that for behavioral type tasks, it's um, fairly straightforward. Um, you just give the CNO and then you can run your behavioral task. So you don't have tethers to worry about, like in optogenetics. Um, and so it's um, for, for that regard, it's really good. Um, and then supposedly you can reuse the CNO multiple times um, without any effect. Um, so on, on that level, I, I think it, it's great. Um, some people would say that the injection itself is quite a stressful thing to do. We're very lucky at Bristol that we have a colleague um, Emma Robertson, who does a lot of work on um, animal behaviour. And in her lab, they developed this technique where you can do an IP injection that's really not stressful, doesn't appear to be stressful for the animal. So Ellen took that approach as well, which was um, really good. But I think a lot of people would find the systemic um giving of the injection, IP injection to, to a rat, particularly over time, you know, when you do these experiments, we, they come in as adults and then they take, you know, you do the viral injection and then over a period of time, you've got to train them in a task. So they end up being quite big rats, although they are um, food restricted, food restricted, obviously for, um, to sort of motivate them to do this behavior. Um, so some people I don't think would get along with that, but um yeah, so if you look up Emma Robinson's papers, she does um, has sort of talked about how to sort of do this one-handed method. Um, I guess the other advantage, is also, I guess, if you're particularly using mice, is that you could target particular neuronal populations, um, which um, would be nice as well. And obviously, you can sort of see when you're transfected um, the cells. Um, 
we've tried doing some experiments um, I haven't shown here where we tried to um, target the terminals that, and then tried to implant a cannula to then infuse the CNO. That has been limited success. And I don't know if it's because it's terminals versus the cells. Um, although other colleagues here at Bristol have had some success in that. And again, I don't know if that's just particular to the cerebellum and in other brain regions as um, they have had more success in that. I think cerebellum is always very special and particular on some things that it works in other brain structures, but not, not cerebellum. Um, but as a starting point, I think it's a, it's a okay technique to use. Um, but yeah. Sounds so, good. Sounds good. Abby has her hands up. Abby, please go ahead. Hi, Nadia. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I was curious if you've noted um, whether the um, the temporal report becomes more variable in, in addition to becoming longer. Have you noticed a, an effect on sort of the precision of the of the um, estimate? That's a very good question. We haven't looked at that, but um, that's a something that we should should look at because often that's what people do look at um in human studies is they do look at that variability um so yeah that's something we should do thank you thank you wonderful i hope um you guys have a wonderful tuesday nadia thank you so much um uh have a great week uh, in america we have thanksgiving i wish everybody a wonderful thanksgiving and uh, um, uh, have a wonderful week. And uh, I won't see you next week. No seminar, but then the week after. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you very much.